It was just over a year ago now that I began a journey I had severely underestimated in a multitude of ways. When I started working on TGB's very first episode, I underestimated just about everything about it, but the sheer size and difficulty of the project was just... I, I was dumb, okay? It goes without saying, but Red Dead 2 is a super long game as is. I mean, trying to complete it with as few kills as possible is pretty much confirming that you'll still be trying to complete it when you're six foot underground and full of worms. This probably goes without saying as well, but basically, the reason there hasn't been an episode in like six whole months is because I grew very overwhelmed as the episodes went on. But to cut a short story even shorter, I've just been thinking a lot about the series lately in general, and overall, I... I feel excited. I feel excited to jump back into it, you know? I miss the characters, the ridiculous story we have going. Even just, you know, the creative process of making a TGB episode is something I'm really keen on jumping back into again. But yeah, here we are with a season one recap. Before we jump into the next season of TGB, the long-awaited return of Western Jesus, Frank the Telekinetic Horse, and Micah the Unstoppable, we've got to jump back in with a juicy recap. Genuinely, thank you guys so much for sticking with the series despite its hiatus. Um, I really do appreciate it, and I really hope you all enjoy. We began the adventures of Western Jesus within the blurry white chaos of a ferocious snowstorm. Our mission was simple as it is now, attempt to beat Red Dead Redemption 2 with as little kills by the player as possible, accepting knockouts when absolutely necessary to progress, avoiding the use of weaponry at all as best we could, and steering far away from adding a strike to that dreaded kill tally. A hard task with undoubtedly a long journey ahead, but these right here were our crucial first steps. Western Jesus and his family of do-good outlaws were cold and starving. Upon setting out in search for food and shelter, Western Jesus, Dutch, and Micah stumbled across a small shack clearly occupied by people. Right here is where we would encounter our very first challenge in the series. With no available lasso this early into the game and a very obvious naivety in terms of the difficulty that lay ahead, we stumbled clumsily through this mission, quickly racking up a hefty amount of attempts with very little success. We came to realize that not everybody in the gang was as serious about Arthur's mission or his goals. We soon found that Dutch, although taking technically the leader of this collective, showed very little leadership as he stood doing nothing to help the cause for the entire mission. This was also where we saw a similarly disappointing display from Micah Bell, who showed just as little care for the ambitious goals of Western Jesus. To make the West a better place, to overthrow the evil that had gradually corrupted it. He cowered away, offering very little assistance to the team, before sustaining a massive slap from one of the enemies. And so began the domino effect inside the mind of Micah Bell. Stunned as he was, this began a very important important process of realization and change. The next time we'd fight alongside him, we would eventually see his true form revealed. After completing the main portion of the first mission with just three knockouts, we would leave episode one with two new companions by the side of Western Jesus. Newly widowed Sadie Adler, and of course, his soon-to-be best friend, a telekinetic horse named Frank. Episode 2 picks up right where we left off. The gang is tired, hungry, and in dire need of some funds to fuel their quest to save the West. Dutch hatches a plan to rob a train owned by a notoriously evil figure, Leviticus Cornwall, and proposes for the gang to rob the train of its V-Buck supply, instantly aging this episode like milk because apparently Fortnite jokes were somewhat humorous at the time. During planning, Abigail requests Western Jesus to go looking for John, as he's been missing for a couple of days. So Arthur rides off into the mountains with his new companion companion Frank and his old companion Javier to begin the search. It isn't long before they discover a seriously wounded John, however, and begin the track back to camp to ensure his safe return. But it's here that we encountered our very first animal enemies in the series. After experiencing great difficulty avoiding these
these wolves. We passed the first wave with some incredible luck as they toppled off the mountain, but unfortunately had to trample two of the following three to progress. Once John was returned safely to the camp, we were immediately met with our next objective, following the sighting of one of the gang's worst adversaries, the deer who killed Davy. So, Weston, Jesus, and Frank set off once again, this time alongside the gang's best hunter tracker, Charles. Although Davy's killer possessed some interesting abilities, he was taken care of swiftly, easily, and as honorably as the game would allow. Moving on to the following mission, Dutch prepares the team for a battle against the O'Driscolls in hopes of securing some equipment for their V-Buck robbery. Here, we undergo one of the most excruciatingly difficult missions of the entire series, and spend real-life days attempting to beat it without kills, and with as few KOs as we can. After a truly soul-crushing amount of attempts, all hope is seemingly lost. That is, until Micah is bitch-slapped once again by a disarmed enemy, awakening the true warrior that had laid dormant inside him all this time. Through the power of BS PTSD, Micah goes on an incredibly unexpected rampage, killing almost every enemy in the mission, and allowing us to walk away with a measly two unavoidable knockouts. This miracle victory is short-lived, however, as another wave of O'Driscolls come barreling out of the forest. Episode 3 kicks off with a battle in the trees against the remaining O'Driscolls. Completely contrary to the events of Episode 2, this portion of the mission was really quite simple. Micah's BS PTSD rampage continued, but it was here that we first learned of the toll such an outburst could take on Micah's body. As he hung back and rejuvenated his energy, Weston, Jesus, Frank, and the rest of the gang handled the remainder of the mission with ease, walking away from this segment without a single knockout or kill. The remainder of Episode 3 focused on the notorious V-Buck heist the mission where we would eventually clash with the infamous train conductor and his phantom shovel. Now, if you remember this horribly grueling mission as well as I do, you'll recall how useless Lenny was for majority of it. His inexperience as an outlaw spoke volumes as he died over and over and over again while attempting to reach the front of the train. However, in a pretty mind-blowing turn of events, it was actually Lenny who eventually saved Weston Jesus from being forced into killing the train conductor via a seemingly unavoidable scripted event. And despite having to knock one enemy out on the train to activate Lenny's burst of confidence, it seemed to carry over for the rest of the mission, as the remainder of the train heist was much, much easier. After securing the V-Bucks and returning back to camp, the gang set their sights on a small working town named Valentine, and it's here that season one of The Goodest Boy in the West took a very important turn. Episode 4 opens with a campfire story describing that the legend of Western Jesus and his best friend Frank was beginning to spread. Their good deeds were not going unnoticed, and tales of their amazing abilities were heard far and wide. Also, as I said, Episode 4 was an extremely important turning point for the series, as it was the episode Western Jesus would finally receive his iconic drip. However, half the battle of Episode 4 would be acquiring enough money to actually purchase said drip, as Frank and Arthur would discover their net worth was limited to about $10 dollars and a half eaten packet of oat cakes. The quest for Arthur's powerful new outfit would take our boys halfway across the country, as the white pinstripe pants could only be found in San Denis, or Road Town, as I had properly named it. Episode 4 was an episode full of fistfight tutorial missions that led to a forced knockout here, and three forced knockouts in the saloon bar fight. This was the most knockouts in one sitting we would ever encounter in Season 1's entirety. However, after Episode 4 released, I received an influx of comments that alerted me to a major oversight. One of the knockouts in the saloon was in fact avoidable, and as unfortunate as this oversight was, it was one I would have to live with nonetheless. Episode 4 continued with Arthur and Frank searching desperately for one especially good deed that they could carry out to right the wrongs of those devastating knockouts. They set their sights on a rescue mission involving a somewhat forgotten character of the series, that foolish magician who had accidentally transformed himself into a double barrel shotgun. Fortunately, this rescue mission went down without a hitch, not a single knockout or kill despite the sheer amount of enemies we encountered, and that foolish magician has been holstered safely on Frank's saddle ever since.
I've often said that episode 5 is probably my least favourite episode of TGB, but after looking back on it, it had quite a lot of notable moments packed in there. First of all, Micah is rescued from the clutches of Strawberry Security without a single knockout or kill, and this was just beyond unexpected for me at the time, especially considering that whole problem we had with Micah's BS PTSD backfiring mid-mission, leaving him in a constant motionless trance. But yeah, besides that, helping Micah escape from the West's most feared security detail was honestly quite easy. After the prison break, Micah made the tough decision to leave his friends and journey out into the wilderness on a path of self-discovery. Hopefully, with some time, he could grow to understand and potentially harness his BS PTSD in ways that were never thought possible. Following this, Hosea embarks on a mission with Arthur to take down the copycats of Davy's killer. This leads to an unavoidable assassination of this rabbit and a surprisingly non-lethal encounter with this bear. The animal's criminal underworld is seemingly thwarted once again. Following the hunting mission, episode 5 takes us to Flatneck Station, where everyone's favourite drunken nuisance with a likeness to Hammy from over the hedge is making a fool of himself once again. It's here that Western Jesus loses access to his lasso for some reason, and is forced to find a way to stop Kratos from harming the Reverend. Eventually, one of my favourite strats of the entire series is discovered, and before long, Kratos is taken care of by his own ignorance to watch his step around an active campfire. The Reverend is returned to camp, the sun goes down, and our boys finally catch up on some well-earned sleep. In episode 6, Arthur wakes up from his sleep after a string of cryptic nightmares. These nightmares have fueled him with an incredibly strong impulse to visit three specific locations around the West. Firstly, to the home of his old friend Mary, secondly, to the home of the horribly tempered Thomas Downs, and lastly, to the plains just outside Blackwater. As Frank and Western Jesus begin visiting these locations, they realise each one appears to have a dangerous task attached to it. Mary requests for Arthur to rescue her brother from a bunch of phony copycats of Western Jesus. This is done successfully without any knockouts or kills, but it is the first instance of unavoidable gun use. After visiting Thomas Downs and finding a way to avoid beating him to a pulp, Western Jesus receives some awfully vague and unnerving messages from him. Threats that Western Jesus brushes off at first, but would come to think a lot more on later. The final location just short of Blackwater leads Frank and Arthur to yet another rescue mission. Here we work together alongside Charles, Javier and Trelawney in order to save their friend Sean from the clutches of Ruth bounty hunters. Here, among the rocks, we encounter the Cliff Goblins, some of the most difficult and frustrating enemies to bypass by far. After a truly painful fuckload of attempts, we were able to complete both part 1 and part 2 of this mission with a very surprising zero knockouts and zero kills. We came ridiculously close to never finding a solution to this section right here, so the clean completion of this mission was especially relieving. Episode 7 begins three months since Micah first embarked on his journey, and both Frank and Western Jesus have grown increasingly worried for his welfare. After a long and tiresome search across the West, they unexpectedly find Micah stationed at a lonely campsite. He explains to the boys exactly what he'd been doing all this time, using a few weeks for deep reflection and the rest on a mission for good. He takes the boys along to his new side project, intercepting a wagon owned by Strawberry Security, used to transport both goods and prisoners to the town. Surprised by Micah's sudden focus on fighting the good fight, the boys jump in to help him intercept the wagon. Here we're faced with an awfully unfair and confusing mission in which the main obstacle for us is a one-shot death no matter how high our health is. We struggled desperately for a long time through the Sultana phase, only to come out victorious thanks to perhaps the luckiest success in the entire series. Afterwards, we learn a little bit about what Arthur calls the Horse Bonders, before escaping with the wagon triumphantly. Our success is only momentarily celebrated, however, as we're met by a second wave of strawberry security in a wild ambush. Here, we're met with a very similar one-shot death obstacle, but we soon realise it's much easier to counter here than it was prior. And before long, Micah the Unstoppable, Frank the Telekinetic Horse, and Western Jesus complete yet another mission with a beautiful zero knockouts and zero kills. Following the victory, the trio go on to deliver their intercepted supplies to those in need, but Arthur believes their biggest challenges may still lay ahead, as fragments of Mr. Downs and his threats begin to piece themselves together.
Okay, we, we got a lot to get through with this one. Episode 8 takes place just a few weeks after Micah is reunited with the gang. In these very busy few weeks, John had completely recovered from his injuries and had begun using his spare time to do some recon. After taking notice of an influx of visitors to Valentine, the city of mud that was only visited by strangers if the situation was dire enough, John befriended a group of travellers in order to gain information and quickly confirmed many of Arthur's suspicions. Leviticus Cornwall was a fucked up bloke with plans to do some pretty fucked up things, many of which involved turning the West's residents against each other and slowly taking control of the entire country. But there was even more than that, deeper ambitions that the gang would only come to find out after a dangerous mission involving the theft of a combustible barricade, which was done without any kills or knockouts mind you, stolen for the sole purpose of intercepting Cornwall's train full of more travellers. Travellers that could have more information that the gang could use to get one step ahead of Cornwall and his master plan. And so they do just that but not without encountering an unavoidable knockout locked to an animation that I simply couldn't bypass no matter how many strategies I threw at it. Oh, and of course followed by an absolute demon of an ambush that was incredibly difficult to pass due to its strict mission limitations. Frank interrogates the passengers while the rest of the boys deal with the ambush, and eventually we do escape the mission with just that one knockout under our belt. Upon escaping successfully, the boys part ways until the next day, where Frank explains his intel to John and Arthur while on the way to rescue some sheep. Why were they rescuing some sheep? Well, because Frank had discovered that Cornwall was very much aware and very much inspired by Western Jesus and his powerful telekinetic companion. He'd heard the stories, noticed the dent they'd put in his evil endeavours, and now he'd shifted his attention to replicating the power that he'd seen in Frank. For that, he would stop at nothing. For a soldier of those capabilities at his side, Leviticus Cornwall would do whatever it took. So he'd promised riches for people far and wide, as long as they could bring him enough subjects to experiment on, enough subjects to attempt a replication of the one and only Frank. After successfully placing the sheep in hiding, the boys set out to round up everyone in the gang and get far, far away. They needed time to prepare for Cornwall, as they suspected a man of his power and influence would be far far too dangerous to take on without a plan. After finding Dutch and Strauss getting plastered inside the saloon, John and Arthur alert them to the situation and are about to escape when Leviticus Cornwall himself arrives unexpectedly outside. Members of his army hold both John and Strauss at knife point. There is no easy way out in sight. Leviticus taunts Western Jesus and threatens him that this is his final chance to stand down, his final chance to get out of the way of his plans for good. With his friends at death's door, and only seconds to devise a plan, the fate of the West lays once again on the shoulders of Western Jesus. 